Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. In March, disability advocates with the St. Louis Metropolitan Alliance for Reliable Transit, or SMART, issued its first report card for Metro Transit. Marks were not great or even good. In fact, they were near failing grades, so there's much room for improvement. When, the following month, Metro announced it would take public feedback on a proposed tightening of its Colorado reservations policy, members of the public that included advocates with the local nonprofit Paraquad responded with recommendations of their own. Between now and July, Metro Transit will hold community listening sessions to arrive at some decision regarding the Colorado reservation policy, among other accessibility matters. Joining us now to discuss that process and get perspective on real-life experiences of St. Louis transit users with disabilities, we have Jeanette Mott-Oxford, Public Policy and Advocacy Manager with Paraquad, a disability services and advocacy organization in St. Louis. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. We also have Talby Roach, President and CEO of By State Development. Welcome back to you as well. Thank you for having me. And we have Seyun Choi, former public policy intern at Paraquad and social work master's student at St. Louis University. Welcome to you as well. Pleasure to be here. And thank you all for making time to talk with us today. Let's talk about that Metro report card. Jema, what were the major critiques therein? We had four main categories. One was ADA compliance, and, and we had to give a failing grade on that because there are so, so many denials still. Um, if you receive federal money, you're supposed to offer equity, uh, you know, equitable service to people with disabilities. And uh, in their most recent operations report, um, nearly 7,000 rides were denied for call ride users, uh, the, the folks with disabilities using the paratransit uh, service call ride. So uh, that was of grave concern to us. Uh, we also um, uh, we gave a slightly better but still failing grade on meaningful engagement with people with disabilities. And that's mainly about um, just not thinking to include us from the beginning of the process. So often, uh, if, if you do have people with disabilities come you know, look at a piece of equipment that you're considering buying, they'll let you know whether it works well for them. Are they going to bump their head you know, get, mm. getting in? Does the, the ramp uh, work equally well for wheelchairs and for people that have to walk up it? Mm. So um, there's this failure around meaningful engagement uh, with, uh, for people with disabilities. Um, customer experience was our final uh, category, and, and we gave our, probably our best uh, grade on that because Metro really is trying a lot harder to communicate with us now. So we'd seen some real uh, improvement there. The fact that we're sitting here in the studio together, you know, is another indication that there's better communication, I think. Lots of lots of talk is happening. We get a stakeholder letter every month. That's a nice thing. Mm -hmm. um, so we see a, some improvement there. Right, right. Yeah. So, Toby, as you're as you're listening to what JMO is sharing about the that first report card, were you surprised by that evaluation? Well, so I certainly am not not surprised, but I would not, you know, it's disappointing um, to have that kind of a grade. I think that we have a lot of employees who go out there and work really hard, but I do, I would completely concur mm -hmm. that we can do better, okay? And that uh, the fundamental pieces uh, and the evidence um, as far as our rides are concerned show that we need to improve the system. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to improve the system in, in many of those areas that JMO uh, mentioned, in engagement, in fundamental capacity issues. And we've been working very hard on those. And we've shown some progress over the past 16 months. But it's a hard, difficult process, a lot, of, lot rooted in the capacity as far as employment is concerned. But I think it's very fair as a publicly supported agency we have an obligation to lean in and listen as best we can, and I'm committed to that. I like critiques because critiques are, are the basis for us to get better, and I think that's what we're all interested in. Mm -hmm. And speaking of all who are mm -hmm. interested in this, 
the reason that we are talking and one of the the big things that we're going to be discussing is Coloride. So for mm-hmm. those who are are not familiar with that, Coloride offers non-fixed route transportation for people with disabilities in St. Louis and it is also something that is mandated by the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now, Seyun, you are someone who uses Coloride and you began using it in 2014. But I realize that uh, over the past couple years, you've given up on using paratransit service. Why is that? I think there are a couple of reasons for that. I felt that being able to reserve ahead of time is is simply not giving me the sense of autonomy that I need. Um, And I do happen to live in in, in a more urban area uh, right between the north and south campuses of St. Louis University. And that particular area of Midtown um, does have really strong um, Metro bus and Metro link access. Um, so that for me has not been very much of an issue in, in me gaining those those level of skills, being able to travel independently using a fixed route system has been has been huge advantage. However, um, in, in instances where I need to travel to maybe more suburban locations, as we all know, St. Louis is very much a car dependent region. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've, I felt that um, very much so. And when they lived in Chesterfield, places like Chesterfield or out in West County, and when I have to go out to places for my part-time job at the moment, um, the caller ride is a better solution simply because oftentimes maybe a bus stop is, is 20, 25 minutes away from a larger larger street or, or larger um, sort of part of the area where the bus fixed route system runs, and I felt like that was a viable solution at the time, knowing that f- scheduled routes are going to continue to run for most cases, not all the time. Um, they're going to stick to their rigid schedule has been a more reliable option for a, a person like me. Yeah. And when you say a person like you, you are not a, a, a passenger who's going to be traveling by yourself. Right. I um, I am accompanied by my guide dog um, up, up by my side for a lot of my transportation. Um, and metro vehicles have been and the operators have been very, um, they have not resisted at all in any capacity on my ability to, to board either Metrolink or Metrobus um, due to their training and knowledge of, of transporting passengers with disabilities with accompanied by service animals. Mm-hmm. So that's something positive to hear, right, Toby? Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Now, you just finished up uh, an internship in public policy with Paraquad Seyun last month, where you engaged with many Coloride users. What is it that you heard from them about Coloride accessibility and quality? Um, many of the stories that were shared through our um, organized coalition, the St. Louis Metro Alliance for Metropolitan Alliance for Reliable Transportation, has been of stories who have um, numerous stories who have um, really been of, of customers who have been mainly ro- relocated their place of residence. And as we all know, moving is a very daunting task and a, d- a difficult task for particularly people with disabilities as they acquaint to new spaces. Mm-hmm. And when we've learned of those the route changes last March um, going into April, I think a lot of those individuals have really voiced their, their frustrations at us mm-hmm. uh, about um, feeling isolated, feeling their feeling trapped at their resident. They don't feel like they have the sense of autonomy. I think it's really important to emphasize that that autonomy, that that tra- public transportation plays, at least in my, I, my personal life, right? As someone who is not able to drive due to my blindness, I think being able to walk a few blocks and board that metro link and expect reliability is something that has to happen pretty urgently. So... The Metro Transit now has proposed shortening the reservation booking window for Metro Coloride from three to five days in advance to next day reservations only. And say you've just talked about autonomy, people being able to make decisions um, for themselves sort of on, on the time that they need it. Tell me, what are the reasons by state is considering this particular change? Well, one of the things that we're trying to achieve by this is open it up to public comment and indeed have this exact kind of discussion about 
why we were looking at this. In the, mostly what we're trying to do is try to be as efficient as possible with what our current capabilities are. And we are limited by our employment. We're doing our best to increase our employment and get as much out there as possible. But, but what we have seen by looking at the numbers when we were at the five-day reservation, for instance, on a Friday, we would see a big sp spike on Friday activity. And when we looked at those numbers, let's say, and remember, we're, we're scheduling nearly 6,000 rides a week. It's a lot. Um, and what we were seeing when we an analyzed those rides in reverse is that then we were seeing a fair number of cancellations within that four-day window, which is reasonable mm -hmm. because, of course, people's look, their, their plans change, you know, maybe they had to go to the doctor and they don't, or any of, you know, life happens. It's very reasonable. And so we just saw that as an opportunity to kind of increase in efficiency. And we saw this big spike where Friday gets very difficult. Um, and also one of the things that we heard and continue to hear and is a goal for us is to have a window of next day reservations. So for instance, as, as Se Young mentioned, you know, uh, hey, maybe I want to go and meet some friends for something and, and get to a capacity in Colorado where we can uh, fulfill that need. Mm -hmm. um, we can't right now. i be very honest. We're not there. Um, we have improved, improved tremendously over the past 16 months, but we need to look at those different kind of pieces to tune the system so that it is as efficient, efficient as possible. We need to take a quick break here, but mm -hmm. we will be back shortly to continue this conversation. Let's return to our conversation about proposed changes to Metro Transit's reservation system for its call-a-ride service. We're speaking with Toby Roach, President and CEO of By State Development, Jeanette Mott-Oxford, or JMO, Public Policy and Advocacy Manager with Paraquad, and Seyun Choi, a social work master's student at St. Louis University who uses Metro Transit. Before the break, we were talking about cancellations, um, efficiency with the system around call a ride, and I wanted to make sure that I asked uh, you, JMO, about this proposed change. Yes. Yeah. And last month, the St. Louis Metropolitan Alliance for Reliable Transit, the members voted to publicly oppose yes. the proposed next day reservation only change. Why are they against it? Well, they, they felt that it would uh, give them less uh, ability to be independent and, and uh, uh, make choices uh, for their life. You can imagine uh, often when you try to go to make a, a medical appointment, it can take a while. I, I just recently got uh, uh, an appointment scheduled for three or four weeks out in the future, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, what if I make that appointment and then I have to call the day before to set up my ride and I discover I can't get a ride? Right. Then I have to start booking that trip all over again. And and we, we don't understand why this would be good for the St. Louis region in that it would make us an outlier. We've looked at other major metropolitan areas uh, and Kansas City uh, offers one to 14 days for, mm -hmm. for their booking. Um, so the only other place that we found that did this next day only reservations was uh, Los Angeles. Oh. Uh, and Jess Segovia, the ADA consultant that was hired, worked in Los Angeles. So we're sure. thinking this may be an idea that he brought, but it's an outlier idea and mm -hmm. it makes life less flexible. You know, at, at Paraquad, we're part of the independent living movement uh, of the 1970s, where, where basically people with disabilities said, we're part of the normal human diversity. We, it's not that we're abnormal. We, we don't want to be seen as, oh, they're the normal people and here are the people with disabilities. We are part of the normal uh, uh, normal diversity of, of, of humankind. And what we want is barriers out of our way so that we can have choices and be independent and participate in society with freedom. Right. And, and so uh, giving us a one day only reservation window does not feed what we want, which is a society that uh, that is makes it possible for us to have the same the same kind of freedom that that other folks do. Mm -hmm. And we do have a window into that from another uh, call a ride user. 
Dwayne Gruss uses call a ride daily, and he said he usually waits up to 45 minutes to book a ride. He said he also opposes the proposed next day reservation policy. And so I personally would like to see the thing stay the way it is because I think there's going to be a, a lot of people calling at 7.30 in the morning every every day to get the rides for the next day. So I would be very nervous about not being able to get my rides every day because everybody's going to be everybody's going to be on the phone. And for somebody who's dependent on the the ride like I am, it's vital to get the ride otherwise I don't go to work. Now, Sayun, how would having next day reservations only for scheduling call a ride services affect day to day life for you? I think there are a couple of different multifaceted sort of discussions to be had around the next day only policy. And I think one of the things that really stands out to me is, is, um, as, as we've voiced in the past, I think the, the duration in which the phone hold, um, as Duane discussed earlier, um, I think we live in a time now especially where, where on-demand rides have have really increased in popularity um, for people on on the move, and we acknowledge that there are services, uh, rideshare services that are serving St. Louis region, like uh, private rideshare companies like Uber and Lyft. Uh, while the, you can secure those kind of rides, oftentimes the p- cost of those can add up significantly. Sometimes um, to book a one way trip from a, a, a place A to a place B can can be as much as twenty five or thirty dollars when you're only driving um say five or six miles and I think the other thing is you know three to five days does allow you know passengers to be able to get those in time, but then also allowing those flexibility not strictly just one day only um appointments sensitive you know workplaces that we need to be there's we just cannot have those kind of toss up um I've noticed even a toss up. Um, and those ambiguous situations in in fixed route system. The other day, I was going to work, um, exited Ma- Metrolink at a Maplewood station, and the bus was not present because the train ran about four minutes late um, due to a, ma- a door issue. And and that's certainly no fault of the operator; it's simply a mechanical error. Mm-hmm. Um, those sensitive time connections meant that I was not able to catch a bus that runs once an hour, and now I'm stranded at a Maplewood station and and not knowing. And then that fear of the unknown is, I think, what has really hurt the disabled community, in particular transportation, because we just, we need to know sometimes how things are going to go and how things are going to look like. Oftentimes I find myself planning a, a commute, um, often looking at my phone an hour or hour and a half in advance so I can map out what time should I be getting ready to catch catch the train at what time to arrive at a station that where I need to transfer. And I and while I'm certainly accustomed to that, to that lifestyle, those misconnections can really leave sort of an ambiguous situation. Now I'm scrambling to call the Metro Transit information line to see what, what are the options they have. In most, of, most cases, they'll say, just wait an hour. Mm-hmm. And I need to be at work within an hour. Right. And I had to catch that bus. And that, I'm stranded. And they said, I can, we cannot do anything else for you. And that, I've, I've heard that many times. And... and that has certainly been sort of a for, for an issue for us. It's those ambiguous toss up when when our trip we cannot get that trip when we cannot make those transfers. That's mm-hmm. that's a misconnection. Toby, does the opposition uh, from Smart members make you hesitant about implementing these changes to call a ride as they've been uh, as they've been presented? Oh, sure, of course. I mean. Um, what what we're trying to do is balance the needs of the of the riding public with where our capacity was and you know a goal would actually be that we have a an advanced reservation system along with the next day i mean that's been publicly stated by members of smart many times that's that's the best service mm-hmm. and i i think that would be best and and would provide the most flexibility to the community. I I think that's the goal we should reach for. Um, We were just looking at how could we tune the system and the reservation system to avoid some of these large spikes that, 
you know, Se Young and, and J Mo have, have mentioned in their comments that they're real. Mm-hmm. And they're real uh, associated with the capacities uh, behind our operators and our recruiting efforts. And we've had some really good progress. Great insight from Mr. Segovia. Um, we're being very, very aggressive at. We have new contracts, new labor contracts on ADA, which is really great news uh, in order that we can build that capacity to fulfill these pieces. But in the interim, until we get there, we don't have magic wands. We need to show progress, and we've shown tremendous progress over the past 16 months. In fact, we'll be returning a lot of the frequency to the system at our next service change in June, which will inc- uh, increase the service that Se Young is, is mentioning. Um, and we need to continue to hit those efforts and keep recruiting and getting more people. We have great jobs at Metro Transit, but not anybody can do these jobs. Look, mm-hmm. it's, we need a highly qualified operator. It's a, it's a good job. It's paid well. But we need folks who show up regularly. Look, I need show, put folks who are going to show up at 4.30 a.m. to mm-hmm. drive a 40-foot Gillick bus down Kings Highway. That, not everybody can do that. Right. No. There have been some changes to service that mm-hmm. I want to make sure that we get to. Mm-hmm. Last April, Metro Colorado scaled back Colorado transportation services in the outer parts mm-hmm. of St. Louis County. And Metro at that time had said that this will significantly reduce trips, uh, trip denial and phone reservation wait times. Mm-hmm. This is clearly something that, that folks have been struggling with. We heard from Colorado user Dwayne Gruce earlier. He also had said that restoring these services is something he wants Metro to do in the near future. Well, I would like to see them restore service that they took away because of driver shortage. They're getting more drivers now. So one thing that would make me very happy is if they would restore the services that they took away. So, Talby, are there any immediate plans to go back to the old service boundaries or to make some adjustments? So we're already returning some service when we did actually when we were able to recover on Metro bus employment. And that really has to do with more frequency of service. We had seen, we had reduced service and returned a lot, nearly 16 routes in January of this year, where, for instance, maybe an, an uh, frequency was at an hour, um, and then we moved it back to 30 minutes, et cetera, that kind of density of service. That's mostly associated with Metro Bus and Metro Link. Mm-hmm. So now we have recovered as far as that is concerned, so now we need to turn to the employment needs of uh, Coloride. And we're not there yet. We still have some more recruiting to do before we would be able to expand that service area. Uh, part of the effort um, that we move back to the federally mandated service area, which is indeed what we are fulfilling right now, was to move those trip denials. Quite frankly, because of the scarcity of labor, the system was broken. We needed to look very seriously at it. We had way too many denials and very, very difficult for the community to react. Those are totally fair critiques and, and simply is the facts. So we had to make a hard decision to reduce that so that within the core area, within the federally mandated area, we could uh, recover. And I want to get that trip denial number, which right now is down to 10 percent, was as high as 38 and 40 percent back in April. We have it down to 10. It needs to be zero, folks. I mean, that's absolutely what it has to be. Mm -hmm. The ADA consultant who has been brought in by mm-hmm. Metro, JMO, you mentioned, uh, Jess Segovia. Jess Segovia came in a few months ago to evaluate the transit system here in St. Louis. Talby, what is it that you have learned from his evaluation thus far? Yeah, no, Mr. Segovia was was great. Um, had a lot of information for us. And what we're really trying to do is take a look at not only uh, increasing and doing a better uh, job at public outreach and try to engage with the public about what kind of system they want to see, but also take the expertise of Mr. Segovia so that we can really honestly reset our service, okay? Some of the really apt and accurate criticisms were you know, our cultural sensitivity to the ADA community, not just on cholera, but we asked Mr. Segovia to look at how 
um, the ADA community was being uh, really treated on a customer service level on buses and trains. And for instance, when a bus, let's say the number 70 grand, I have an operator who's, whose job is to move that bus as quickly as possible. But let's say we had a wheelchair customer on waiting at a bus stop. It takes time. And so adding a piece of respect, you know, for that individual, you know, being culturally sensitive to that person and encouraging them to feel part of that community instead of, you know, being perceived as, quote, slowing the bus down. Those were some really tough criticisms to listen to. Mm-hmm. and But they were fair. And our job is not to be punitive, but how do we lean into these great operators who, who do a great job and 99% of the time it's, it's great, but how can we be sure that our system is welcoming and respectful of every single customer, no matter what uh, their, their disability or ability may be? Mm-hmm. So, Jamo, you and other advocates You've long called on Metro to more meaningfully engage with the disabled community that was in the the report card. And, uh, you know, the the service aspect, what happens as as people are, as using, they're using the transit. I mean, insofar as the, the consultant is concerned, was bringing Jess Segovia to... St. Louis to, to make some recommendations? I mean, was that a step toward that? Well, there's kind of an interesting history there. Uh, last year on June the 22nd, we had a press conference and one of our demands in that press conference was that they should bring in outside help, somebody that understands how to run a modern and efficient transit system because many of our members have traveled some and say, you know, I, I did better, you know, at this other place that I went to in, in Florida or Seattle or wherever they went. And why don't we bring in somebody that knows how they did it there, and maybe they can help us in St. Louis. So we, we sent off, you know, our, our list of things that, that we wanted to see changed. And Mr. Roach's reply at that time is that they didn't need a consultant, that they had plenty of expertise within the system, and they had communication with other, you know, other parts of the country, and they, they just didn't need to do that. So we were sort of surprised when he announced in November at a county council meeting when uh, money was being appropriated from sales taxes to by state, uh, that they had they had hired this ADA a consultant because we thought it was off the table, <laughs> and on the one hand we got our demand, but our idea of how to do that respectfully is could we maybe help with the interviews or meet the three finalists and offer you some feedback before you sign the dotted line on the contract? That that would have felt more respectful to us. Mm-hmm. So we thought, well, we've got Mr. Segovia. Let's try to make this work as well as we can. And he came to our January 25th SMART meeting and over 30 SMART members were there. And so we were so anxious to hear his report on April 11th. On April 2nd, I was with Mr. Roach and, and Mr. Stewart at a meeting and they said there were really hard things for us to hear in this report, but it's good for us to hear it. And, and I'm a big fan of James Baldwin, you know, who said, uh, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And I thought, good, they're facing the problems now, you know. And then April 11th comes and Jess Segovia gives his report and it sounds like nothing is wrong. And I get an email from Dwayne, who you played the tape of earlier, saying, they're saying nothing's wrong. And I'm like, I'm not the only one that heard it that way. And there was just no public confession of anything being wrong. And that, that is, that is a, a, a problem to us, is that mm-hmm. you can't name specifically what needs to be fixed. So uh, it's still kind of up in the air to us how this is going to work out. In the, our final minutes, Hayun, I would like to know from you, I mean, what is there one change in particular that you would like Metro to take in order to better solicit feedback from riders with disabilities? I think there should either be an on-demand comment box or a live reporting line. Um, So Metro customers with disabilities have a way of um, voicing their feedback real time and then being followed up and saying, hey, we hear you, we listen, and here's what we plan to do. And I know public transit agency is a multifaceted agency, but um, I think what we need is more of a sense of urgency. Imagine if you um, leave, you get ready for your day and you get on the vehicle and your car just simply doesn't start up. That could be quite, pretty frightening. And that, that's sometimes the feelings that I have when I miss that bus connection. And I know the entity that runs that bus 
and Metrolink and Coloride. And I think that is, and if I realize if this is a pattern of, I cannot catch this hourly bus, that sort of is a huge distrust and I feel stuck. And I think at least having some sort of a backup solution, um, that's that, that needs to happen in a very time sensitive, fast way, urgent way um, to know that Metro is listening and then they have my back because Metro ha has my back for me to get around town and I just can't be stuck at home. That's just not right. I have, I have my own bills to pay. I have um, places I need to be and I need this agency in particular to know that, that we can take you, we could keep the region moving. Mm -hmm. Toby, what is it that you're taking away from this particular conversation and taking into the community meetings that will be happening? Well, the opportunity is to show, demonstrate where that ur urgency is. And quite frankly, I think we've done quite a few things to demonstrate the urgency, in, including the, for instance, labor contract that I talked about or, and so on. But we need to demonstrate within the numbers an arc of improvement over time. And it is absolutely accurate to say that we should not be satisfied with where we are now. We are, I am not. Mm -hmm. um, and we're gonna take a really good opportunity to look at what are the things we can do and we're gonna take action on those. And we've done it. I'm proud of the action that we've taken, but by no means are we done. I mean, by no, no means are we done talking. These are valuable things. Toby Roach is president and CEO of Bi State Development. Seyun Choi is a social work master's student at St. Louis University who uses Metro Transit. And Jeanette Mott Oxford, or JMO, is a public policy and advocacy manager with Paraquad. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Thank you. This segment was produced by Aula Kuziz and engineered by Emily Woodbury. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.